All right. Um, again, as, uh, since I don't speak Spanish, I assume that Fernando introduced me. Um, I just want to add a couple of things about myself. As, uh, as you probably see, um, I'm Natalia Stahanova from the uh, University of New Brunswick. Uh, I'm also a New Brunswick Innovation Chair in Cybersecurity um, in Canada. And I'm affiliated with the uh, uh, Faculty of Computer Science uh, in, again, University of New Brunswick. So what I want to talk to you today is one of the projects that we do, uh, um, that we have, well, we haven't finished yet, but we're kind of in the process. And this is uh, one of the interesting results that I thought uh, would, uh, uh, would interest you. Uh, the project is uh, on application uh, level denial of service attacks. And specifically, we were interested to uh, study the impact of sampling techniques, very sampling techniques on, uh, on the detection of these attacks. No, it doesn't work. That's OK. That's OK. <laughs> All right, the, the, it doesn't matter, right? We will try to, do, to go to learn and go as we go. All right, this picture is probably familiar to you. You've seen this. I'm sure you've seen it somewhere. Um, somebody told me uh, a couple of days ago that it looks like Mexico City. It might be, I guess, but it's not. It's, in fact, Russia. Uh, and, um, and as I said, I'm sure you can come up with a number of different uh, places where you probably have seen this. Well, in fact, this is exactly what we have these days, right? The constantly increasing volumes, uh, uh, network volumes, unfortunately only emphasize the lack of our tools to, uh, uh, the ability of our tools to reliably uh, catch the intrusions in real time. So as a result, uh, because of this, because of this uh, inherent difficulty, as a result, uh, the num a number of sampling techniques were introduced. The primary focus of the sampling techniques was to somehow uh, reduce the volume of traffic we're seeing, at the same time keeping the major characteristics intact. Uh, and again, I'm, I'm talking about the major characteristics, the common characteristics, the average characteristics that we're seeing on this particular network. Now, average is probably fine when you're talking about the normal traffic. Unfortunately, it doesn't really do us any good when we're talking about intrusions. And specifically, if you probably, if you probably think about the uh, uh, anomalies, anomaly detection, we're not looking for average. We're not looking for common things. We're looking for the rare incidents. The incidents we might only see once or maybe twice. So that's what we need to catch. That's what we need to keep on our, on, on, on our, um, in our data set that we're going to um, analyze. Unfortunately, most of the traditional sampling techniques that we introduced really didn't worry about the anomaly detection at that point. So as a result, a number of specialized sampling techniques were introduced. And as you probably sense from the way I say it, introduced in academia. Very, very few of them were actually taken to the uh, production environment. Um, the specialized uh, techniques, again, were kind of focusing, uh, mostly focusing on the, uh, on the detection of anomalies, detection of rare events. And um, as opposed to the traditional techniques, um, the uh, security community took this, uh, this, the, this to mean that uh, only small flows or small packets or anything, uh, anything that would be uh, small would somehow reflect the nature of the anomalies that we see on the network. So here um, I actually have an overview of the sampling techniques that were introduced and kind of existed in the past decade probably. Uh, the top three techniques are uh, common. And uh, if I'm not mistaken, they were introduced a long time ago, but they're still sort of uh, in the plane, so I decided to add them here as well. Uh, these, three, uh, these three techniques are so-called static techniques in the sense that they do not provide any kind of adoption to the network conditions, in the sense that uh, you uh, have to provide the conditions for sampling ahead of time. Uh, for example, random sampling, right? We would have to specify that we're looking for 30% to looking to retain 30% of traffic or 50% of traffic. That's all you can really do. So that's what the static techniques mean. Now, the rest of them, in some sense, are adaptive. 
And here, the primary, the primary meaning behind adaptiveness is that they somehow take into consideration the network conditions and the user uh, specifications, and you know, somehow adjust that and give you that, that selection of the traffic. Uh, if we go through the list, and I'm gonna see the list here, um, all, all up to uh, uh, sketch guided, uh, sketch guided sampling, a uh, general type of techniques, generic. They're not specifically introduced for anomaly detection of any kind. Now, the rest, the last five techniques are specific techniques uh, developed for the intrusion detection. And if you look at the, uh, the flow preferences, this is the fourth uh, column uh, on this, uh, in this table, you will see that all the techniques from the top e either have no preference or look for large or medium-sized flows. Now, when we move down in this table, we'll see that the preference uh, changes to the small uh, flows and small sizes. So that's exactly what I meant when, uh, when we're talking about the difference between sampling techniques generated, uh, developed for generic, detect generic uh, network assessment and intrusion detection. So uh, we decided to look at the, this, this 13 techniques and see what the impact of these techniques on the detection of application level denial of service attacks. Why denial of service attacks? And why application level denial of service attacks? Some might think that denial of service attacks are gone. Well, not exactly, right? Especially if you go back, last, just last year we had this uh, notorious spam house, spam house uh, uh, incident when the uh, rates of denial of service attacks just, just plummeted. At some point they reached, they exceeded actually 100 gigabits per second. That's something that we really haven't seen before. Now, so detection, denial of service attacks are still on the radar, unfortunately but we still have to t take care of them. Now, the interesting thing is though, uh, the net network level denial of service attacks have been always there. There's nothing new. We know how to detect them. Flooding is common. There are tools. Um, the nature of attacks is changing. The attacks is there, but the nature is changing, become smarter. They're moving up. We now see attacks at the application level rather than the network level. And at the application level, we're totally unprepared to detect them. So if you think uh, just the recent statistics, if I'm not mistaken, this comes from the Arbor Network's uh, report in uh, uh, this, the, this early year. Um, just into the just last year, 20% of all attacks were application level denial of service attacks. Basically, this is just, again, another indication for us that uh, the denial of service attacks are not really dead. So the application level denial service, as I mentioned, do have a number of advantages. And one of the uh, biggest advantages is uh, the fact that they really use less resources, require less resources from the attacker side. If you think about the, uh, the traditional network level denial of service uh, that is done at the network level, with the increasing, uh, with the increasing uh, network speeds, really the attacker has to almost overcome that on the target side. And that becomes a problem in the sense that, uh, they, that it requires more, it, it becomes more expensive for an attacker to, uh, to uh, uh, conduct the steps for attacks. Uh, application level attacks, application layer denial attacks on the other hand are completely different. All they are bounded by uh, the server resources. So from the attacker side, they are much, they, they come at the cheaper price essentially. Now, they do come at the, price, the cheaper price. They allow to perform a really targeted damage, focusing on a particular service and leaving the rest of services intact. And they also much stealthier because they use less resources, because they come on the application layer, and most of our detection uh, is still, for denial of service detection, is still unfortunately at the network level. So the network level application, application level denial of service uh, attacks often rely on legitimate connections. And since they do rely on legitimate connections, there is nothing you can catch. So uh, unless you do have some kind of protection at the application, uh, pro proxy protection at the application level, uh, this is basically uh, goes under the radar of traditional uh, denial of service uh, attack detection systems. 
So it seems like the application level denial of service attacks are gaining, uh, are gaining the momentum. There are a number of different classifications or taxonomies of application level denial of service attacks, and I know there is one in industry that is very much liked by industry. Um, since I'm more on the academic side, um, I like this particular classification, and which essentially divides all attacks on two uh, classes. High volume attacks, which is basically your flooding, and the low level uh, attacks. The low, the low volume attacks, uh, the attacks that do not require a lot of um, um, traffic uh, from the attacker. And uh, because they do not require a lot of traffic and they do aim to cause targeted damage, they essentially have to, the target has to be sent um, uh, strategically. So there are three types of, uh, three variations of low volume attacks. Um, a low rate attacks that again send the traffic in uh, really in some kind of a pulse uh, motion. Uh, the, this type of attack was actually introduced in academia. It was uh, studied, well studied, I should say, in academia circles. Unfortunately, it's never been seen in the wild, and actually, I don't think it ever went beyond that. So, uh, this is mostly reminds as a theoretical attack. The second type of uh, uh, the low-low volume attacks are slow-rate attacks. Um, as you can probably get from the name, these are the attacks that have to be performed in slow motion. So either sending or receiving slowly would consume service resources. And then finally, the one, the so final variation is a one-shot attack. Well, most of them uh, rely generally exploit some kind of vulnerability on the server side. So that's why they're called a one-shot attack. Uh, the server can simply crash with just one connection or one request or one flow depending on the type of the attack you're performing. So, uh, because the uh, low variation, low rate attack is mostly theoretical, and the one-shot attack is mostly exploiting the vulnerability, we're gonna focus on the uh, low, slow rate attacks for, for this particular presentation. Um, for those of you who are in the field or might have heard about them, you probably have much more detailed explanation of the slow rate and slow read attacks. Um, I don't feel the necessity to go into all the technicalities here, so I'll just give you uh, a very, very basic analogy uh, that will help you to grasp the meaning and the difference between those two types of attacks. So think about, uh, think about a restaurant, or rather, maybe not a restaurant, well, let's say a restaurant. You come to a restaurant, and this, the, uh, the waiter comes to you and asks, what, uh, what would you like to have? And instead of replying, you go, mm, and you start going through the menu. And the waiter waits, right? And he waits, and he waits, and he waits, and he starts losing his patience. And right before he is about to say something, you finally decide that you want a sandwich. He's relieved. He's absolutely happy. And the next question is, okay, what kind of bread would you like? And then, again, you go through the menu, start thinking, hmm. And the, you see the pit, you see the, the anger building on the, uh, the waiter side, you, but you still keep him waiting. And right before he runs out of his patience, you come up with the type of bread you would like, uh, whole wheat. He seems to be okay because he got the answer, but the next question comes, right? What kind of meat would you like? What kind of ingredients would you like? And for every single question that the waiter has for you, you basically keep him waiting until he runs out of his patience. patience. So this is an example of the slow sand attack. Essentially, the attack tries to exploit this uh, timing parameters on the server side to keep the connections open. Now. The slow send is completely different. You start with the order and you do it in normal fashion, everything as usual, the waiter is happy. Now you go pay uh, for, the, uh, for the meal. I know it's all inclusive here, but let's say you do go to the restaurant where you do have to pay for your meal. So you come to a place and uh, let's say the meal costs you $50. And um, instead of paying by I don't know, credit card or c coming up with the bill, 
uh, I don't know, maybe $20, $50 bill, um, what you do, you pull out all the change you had and start paying in pennies, one by one, and you do it slowly. It's not like you're not doing anything. You sort of do something, right? But it takes forever, and it keeps the person waiting. So that's an example of the slow read. So the, as you can see, the, the, the mechanism is very much the same. It's just the difference is how they made and at what point they made. So with the slow read, the server essentially gets the request from you, and to send you the payload, uh, you, you, there are several mechanisms how the mechanisms how, how it can be done. But essentially, you um, start accepting that payload at very slow, extremely slow pace. So you keep the server waiting and keeping the connection open. So uh, we have the sampling techniques. We have the application level denial of service attacks. Oops, sorry. Thank you. Um, you need to know three other pieces um, before we can go into results and actually see what, what this two, uh, uh, what the combination of these two would result into. So data. Well, the data is the problem, right? In academic uh, circles, it's a problem for us because we always need, uh, we always in need of data. We need, you know, the companies are not giving us anything, and the problem is uh, that we, we do to to come up with. Um, uh, reliable results. We do need to test it on something that would resemble uh, realistic data. So for this particular example, what we've done is we set up a testbed environment, and um, since uh, pretty much all these uh, types of application of denial of service attacks uh, are done with uh, various tools, and you might have heard of some of them, Rudy, um, Slow Loris, uh, Hulk, uh, well, this is just uh, to name a few of them. Uh, so what we've done is we run uh, in the testbed environment, we basically run the tools uh, that we could get our hands on um, and generate the traffic. Come, once we've done that, we combine this, uh, this, this traffic with the uh, data set uh, that was created in the lab uh, several years back and is now in use in, in the community uh, to provide some of the realistic setup. So the information about the, the uh, attacks, only attacks, um, are given at this table. We had 26 instances overall of various kinds. Um, so for the detection side, we decided to use a QSOM algorithm. Uh, the QSOM algorithm is very common for detection of denial of service on the network level. It's very simple. It doesn't have uh, it doesn't have a lot of overhead. So it's it's a pretty good algorithm for um, for this type of uh, detection. What we did is uh, we uh, basically moved it to the application level and uh, s uh, tried to uh, see what the result would be. Um, now the uh, so once we had the data and decided on the algorithm, the next question was uh, how are we going to sample? If you uh, remember the table that I've shown in the very beginning, it had both types of uh, sampling techniques, uh, level ba uh, flow based and packet based. So to come up with, to come up with the uh, fair comparison, we had to make sure that we compare in techniques at sort of the same uh, level. So for that, we uh, sampled the traffic was sampled in packets, and then the result was in flows. So for the packet-based sampling techniques, the packets were sampled directly, and then uh, based on the resulting traffic, we generated the flow statistics so that we had some idea of how much flow would result from the sampling. And then for the flow generation, the first step was to generate the flows, and the generation of flows f uh, followed the basic net flow uh, strategic uh, st uh, strategy when you have the five tuple of uh, uh, the IP destination source, the uh, port uh, destination source, and the protocol. So very, very common traditional procedure here. Um, and then uh, once the flows were generated, we sampled the flows, the resulting flows. So at the end, we're, we're working with, uh, with apples. Now, um, as I said, this, it's very important to make sure that the, uh, we have the common ground for comparison, and we used uh, the percentage of sampled flows, and you will see it later on, just to confirm, just to make sure that every single technique was treated uh, equally. Uh, now, what did we get? This is probably the most exciting part of what we got. Um, 
you here you see all the techniques and uh, two columns. The first column basically shows the percent uh, the of flows that have been sampled. As you can see, for some of the for the first column for the 30 percent, we were able to get sampling from all the techniques. The 20 percent unfortunately misses a couple of them. What happened here? Well. Um, the interesting part of this is that some of the techniques, unfortunately, do not have any parameters that allow user to configure the technique for particular, for a particular type of sampling. So even though they're sort of adaptive, they adapt automatically to your network conditions, meaning that uh, you have almost no control how much is going to be sampled and why it's going to be sampled. So for those types of te techniques, unfortunately, we couldn't uh, we, we couldn't control the uh, configuration, so we had to stay with the 30% range uh, where every single technique was able to provide us some, uh, some input. Um, so, what the results are. The first one, the best one that um, you see on top here is the selective flow sampling. We got 100% uh, detection rate and uh, no false, uh, false alerts. This was a surprising result to, uh, to us, at least, because this is not, this is a generic type of technique. Uh, this is a generic type of technique. Um, no, I'm sorry, it's not. It's, it's actually a specialized uh, anomaly detection technique. Uh, but it's been only tested once in one of the studies before and never actually compared to anything else. Now, the other techniques were always had some kind of a comparison that, as you probably can guess, show that they're the best of the, the, the cream, cream of the cream, right? Unfortunately, um, we wasn't able to show this. Now, remember, this is only for the application of denial of suicide attacks. They might be really good for something else, but for, the, for these types of attacks, unfortunately, they were missing a lot. Now, you can, if you can see, some of them are in bold. Uh, I'm not sure if the projector shows that, but those that involve um, uh, specialized techniques developed specifically for, in, in, uh, uh, for intrusion uh, detection field. And as you can see, there are only two techniques on top that do provide somewhat uh, good uh, results, somewhat accurate uh, performance. The rest of them are kind of falling behind um, uh, falling behind with 80% detection. And the last two, the sampling hold and smart sampling give us the worst, well, smart sampling, it's not the worst, it's nothing, right? Essentially, there was nothing being detected. Even though the technique itself was quite, was, was praised for, his, uh, for its quality to retain the traffic, uh, to, to uh, retain traffic uh, measurements and reflect them well. So, uh, we, uh, the 20% was simply provided for the comparison. We wanted to see if we reduce the percentage, how many of them would actually retain the quality of detection. And uh, uh, again, the result is somewhat expected. You would expect them to lose somewhat in the accuracy simply because the le uh, less amount of traffic is retained, is being retained. Now, uh, as I said, we only here the focus was on uh, providing the common ground for the comparison. Now, when you go, when we actually went to the original studies where all these techniques were proposed in the first place, um, every single study uh, employed certain parameters to show that the technique is the best. Well, we've tried to do that as well. What we've done next, we basically uh, con configured the, the techniques to use those particular, the, those particular parameters and see if we can get any better results than this. And as you can see in this table, unfortunately, the results, um, the results are not improving. The, the, uh, the accuracy only goes down, and uh, the uh, uh, parameters uh, the variation of parameters. You can see for certain techniques, for example, uh, fast sampling, uh, there were a number of different variations that we uh, played around with uh, simply because the original study said that this, uh, the parameters that can be employed for different types of network scenarios. So we did th do that. We uh, played with the parameters that were, that were provided. And unfortunately, none of them provided good results to us. Um, so, which clearly speaks for uniqueness of the attacks and perhaps the need uh, for the specialized assembly techniques. 
Now, the two, the two methods that were quite good was the selective, uh, selective flow sampling, the sketch-guided sampling. Uh, the selective flow gave the best performance at the 30%. So we tried to kind of extrapolate this result and see uh, what, uh, uh, what performance we can get if we continue with, uh, with the amount of traffic that will be retained. Um, the uh, sketch guided sampling uh, sort of got into acceptable range, and to me, acceptable is above 95%. Uh, fairly quickly, uh, we had, uh, uh, with 60 70%, 60, we actually got uh, around 95%. Well, you might argue that this is not, you know, this is not enough, it, which, which I would accept depending on the uh, particular conditions you have. Um, now, what about the rest of them? We've seen three, right, that, that, that sort of uh, showed us good performance. What about the rest of them? This, uh, you probably don't, again, you won't be able to see the, all the details, but all I want to uh, point here is the, the general trends. Um, the, uh, the graph on top in the, the corner, left, left corner, right? Your right corner, my left corner, uh, this particular graph. Um, shows you uh, the best performing techniques. And as you can see, the, uh, the, uh, the, the biggest spike that you see, this is the actual traffic without any sampling. The pattern, the spike below that, right below that, is exactly the selective flow-based sampling. And you probably notice how closely it traces the original traffic of the, pa the, the original pattern of the traffic. So it basically explains why you got the, why we got such a good result. Now for the other two, they have exactly the same performance. In our particular, uh, in, our, in our particular scenario, those two uh, types of sampling techniques matched. Now, the first one, of course, was uh, sketch-guided sampling was introduced and uh, the IP flow-based sampling technique followed, saying that the uh, take the inspiration from this cage guided sampling. Well, they do take an inspiration and uh, from the close analysis you'll probably notice but the, that they're very much the same. And as the result shows, there's pretty much no difference. So that's an interesting thing to note that uh, when uh, the, the, there is no, there is no uh, any uh, sufficient difference to, uh, uh, to choose actually between these techniques and perhaps uh, you would go with the original one. Now, the other interesting thing to uh, notice is the, again, the, the slow graph uh, the, closer to me. Um, this graph has, again, original spike with the original traffic and then one that uh, kind of a flat, uh, uh, flat line that sort of combines all a number of techniques. Those number, those techniques that combine in one graph, can anybody guess? These are all the techniques that were introduced specifically for anomaly detection. They all perform very similarly. So, what is the ideal technique, the sampling technique for us, Sample, the ideal sampling technique? Well, the ideal sampling technique would be the one that would reduce, uh, reduce the traffic in size but would keep the pattern, right? So that is exactly what we see with the selective flow sampling. Unfortunately, the rest of them lose both in size and the, pa and the pattern. Now, I do take an argument, though, that yes, the technique might be the best, uh, but unfortunately, it's very expensive. That's true, there are certain types of sampling techniques that are extremely expensive for production environments. So even though they might provide better accuracy, they're not uh, they're really not uh, uh, built for the inline uh, for the inline processing. So we've done additional experiment with the, to look at the CPU utilization. Uh, now, granted, when we talk about the CPU utilization, of course, it depends on what kind of data structures you employ, how exactly you implement the algorithm, what kind of system you run it on. True. Now, don't look at these numbers in as an absolute values. Look at them in relations to each other. This will give you some sense of how different the, the CPU utilization requirements are. And as you can see, the selective flow sampling is, is, is very demanding. But if you look at the IP flow base and the sketch guided sampling, those two that were came second in performance, they actually uh, uh, reduced the uh, CPU utilization 
uh, by two, uh, um, what is, twice, in half, in half. So, uh, and the rest of the techniques, if you look at them, they're somewhat close in performance. So to me, this is an indication that, yes, maybe the selective flow-based sampling, which provides you the perfect accuracy, might not be uh, the best technique from, from the, uh, uh, the, uh, the resources perspective, but you have alternatives. You have some other alternatives that do have, uh, that can offer similarly good performance. So what are the implications of this study? Um, I talked about different, uh, different, uh, different results, and um, I think these are the only things that you really need to keep in mind after all this. We got the best performance with three techniques that somehow never came up as the best in any of the previous studies. Now, of course, I'm talking about the particular kind of attacks, but still, this is worth noting that only three types that somehow never, never, never been seen before is the best, showed the good result for us. Specialized sampling techniques, I think, failed just miserably. They do not retain traffic, they do not retain the volume, and they do not retain their characteristics of the traffic, unfortunately. So from, by any means, they're able to provide good detection. Uh, now, another interesting point that I wanted to mention here is uh, that, uh, of course, a lot of sampling techniques generally uh, reduce the, the size and uh, the, the pattern. This is common. This is uh, it's just a matter of uh, to what extent. Now, the random uh, packet sampling, as uh, uh, we've probably seen in this, in this uh, uh, graph, it only gave us 76%, um, 77% of detection. Now, why I'm drawing your attention to this particular technique? This is uh, this is a technique that is de implemented these days in majority of, in the majority of the Cisco products. It a slight variation of, of this, but it's very much in the core. The sampling is exactly the same. Um, it was originally packet-based sampling, then they, they introduced a slight variation recently. So this is by default your sampling technique that is being used in the, in the Cisco products. So think about this, if this is what we have to deal with, then the lesson should be wherever sampling, wherever technique you're using to, uh, you're using to detect application level denial of service attacks at the application level has to compensate for the deficiencies of the sampling that is on, in place by default. So this is, uh, this is something that I wanted you to keep in mind. And with this, I want to finish your, my presentation. And uh, if you have any questions, you can talk to me now or after the presentation. Thank you. Bueno, si alguno tiene alguna pregunta para Natalia, puede acercarse a los micrófonos que están a ambos lados. Bueno, le pido un aplauso entonces para Natalia.